Let's pray. God, as we get ready to turn to your word, I just pray that you would prepare us for what you have to say this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Happy New Year's. I don't know about you, I find New Year's to be a bit reflective, and maybe more this year than other years, but I have started thinking about this question, who am I? You ever think about that? Who am I as a man? Who am I as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a Costco card member? Who am I? And, and do I like who I am? And who do I want to become? And, and this year, in 2019, I hesitate to say it, but I will turn 40. So that has only amplified my reflections, right? I mean, am I, am I, how am I? Am I healthy? Am I, am, am I halfway? Am I more than halfway? I don't know. Am I going to live to be 80? I don't know what that's going to look like. Something started to happen to me. I stepped on a scale, for the first time in my life, I have gained weight. Don't stare. <laughs> but it's true. I've had to start buying LG large. Where's that going to stop? Well, it's going to be like quadruple XLG. I don't know where that's going. Is my forehead growing? Where's my hair retreating. I don't know what's happening. I, I don't know. And I've been thinking about who am I and who am I going to become and what do I want that to look like? And uh, someone we were talking with recently was talking about legacy. What do I want my legacy to be? And, and I know I'm not alone in that. I know we think about things like that sometimes. Who am I? Or I think maybe this year as we transition and become a Hillside Christian Church, maybe some of you are thinking or wondering, who, who are we? Who are we? Now, if we're no longer Zion Lutheran Church, who am I and who are we? What does that look like? What does that mean? So this morning as we start a new year and we begin as a new church, I thought a good place to start would be this. Who are we? Or what is the church? Because that's what we are as we gather together. Who are we? What, what are we? And so I, wanted, I said we were going to have Bibles. And so who would like a Bible this morning? Yes, Elena, first hand up. Thank you very much. If you want one, just shoot your hand up. And I'll, I'm sure I'll have a helper, and they'll help me give them away, and this will be great. And Yeah, okay. Who else? Cindy wants one. There's no pressure. You don't have to take one. I am making a list, but I won't, won't check it twice. Anybody else up front want a Bible? Yes. Jensen, you got to have a Bible. Up so we will not run out of Bibles. I promise you. Your mom's raising her hand? No, we got more. We got more. You don't have to share. <laughs> so we, as we start this, as we uh, start this morning, looking at uh, who we are or what is the church, we're going to do that by turning to Matthew the 17th chapter of Matthew. We'll read through it, kind of, just kind of work through it, and then we'll go back and just highlight some things. Matthew 17, starting at verse 13. Some of you are opening up a new Bible, never been opened before. You know, there's something kind of cool about that. You get to make the first note in it, the first crease in the back. Smells like good news. Matthew 7, uh, 16, starting at verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13. Just as some context, Jesus has been traveling around with his disciples for a while now. We don't know how long, but uh, enough time that people are talking about him. He, he's reached some level of fame and uh, become a household name. And so there's a lot of discussion going on around who is this guy? Who is this Jesus. We'll pick up there at 13. It says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. I like that as he's talking with his disciples and saying, what are people saying? What are people talking about? I know they're talking. What are they saying about me? And so the disciples have heard some of this, and so they're eager to pipe up. Some of them are saying that you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been preparing the way for Jesus. He'd then been arrested and then beheaded, actually. So some people think Jesus, I think Jesus might actually be John the Baptist, come back to life. It's a pretty significant uh, idea. Other people are saying the prophet Elijah, and Elijah was one of the most powerful prophets and some of the greatest signs, and then was just kind of swept up into heaven. So some people think this Jesus seems a lot like Elijah. God has sent Elijah back to earth. We think this guy's Elijah. Other people are saying Jeremiah, one of the, another great prophet who just wrote lots and lots. He was known as the weeping prophet as he wept over his nation of Israel. They think he's someone significant. They don't know exactly who, but they think that this person, this Jesus, is a somebody, is somebody of weight, of authority, of significance. And those are all good guesses, but they all fall short. Then Jesus says this. Okay, forget about that. Forget about all of them. Who do you say that I am? And I love the nugget in there, just the idea that faith is personal, Right? It doesn't, often I'll, when I talk to someone, I'll say, oh, uh, do you go to church or uh, do you believe in Jesus? And they'll say, oh, my grandma went to church. Like, okay, whoop de do, right? Like, it, that's not really the question it, because your grandma's faith isn't your faith. Your faith is your own. It's this personal thing. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks them. Because faith is individual. As much as we need to share it and, and talk about it and discuss it, it's this personal thing. And so Peter is the one to respond. Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He nails it. I don't know if you remember, but before Christmas, we talked about what Christ means. It means anointed one. Kings and priests were anointed, and it set them apart. It meant that they were separate from the rest of the society. They were distinct. They were unique. They had this special purpose. Peter doesn't say, you are an anointed one, like a king or a priest. He says, you are the Messiah. Jesus, you're the one. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one that has been prophesied for all these years, thousands of years. You're, you're the one above all others, the name above all names, the king above all kings, the Lord above all lords. Jesus, you are it. You're not just some guy sent from God. You are the son of the living God. After the manger, after the Christmas story in Matthew 2 and the manger, this is the climax of the gospel of Matthew. This is where we find out, you know who that baby in the manger was? It's God. That God came to be with us. This is the first time somebody gets it. And so Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar just means son of. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying, Peter, nobody told you that. The disciples don't know that. Uh, the people I've been healing out there, they don't, they don't get it. They don't know it. You haven't heard, learned this from a, a priest or a Pharisee or a scribe or some other leader. No one else has told you this. You heard this from my Father in heaven. We see something here that connects back to Christmas as well. This Christmas we talked quite a bit about Christmas begins and ends with who? Jesus, right? Christmas begins and ends with Jesus, and Jesus is the gift. Here we hear about a second gift, and it's the gift of knowing Jesus. You're right, Peter. 
You're right. You know who I am. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the living God. No one else told you that. You heard it from my Father because he's the one who gives that knowledge. Lots of people knew about Jesus, but nobody knew who he was except Peter. Think about it this way. My son Silas, he loves hockey. His favorite team, Pittsburgh, favorite player, Sidney Crosby. And Silas knows a lot about Sidney Crosby. And so I know now a lot about Sidney Crosby. But he has not once phoned me. Sidney Crosby hasn't dialed me up once. Hasn't emailed me, has, didn't send me a Christmas card. I've never talked to him. I've never gone out for coffee with him. If I do, I expect him to pay. But I don't know Sidney Crosby. I know a lot about him, but I don't know him. Right? There's a significant difference there. I know a lot about Martin Luther. I don't know Martin Luther. I know a lot about Jeff Prost, the host of Survivor. I don't know that guy, though. I mean, I, if I met him on the street, he wouldn't be like, hey, Ian. I feel like I do know him. I've watched him for 37 seasons now. <laughs> That's a lot. But he doesn't know me at all. We don't actually know each other. I just know about him. I know a lot about the colonel at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I can even guess it as 11 herbs and spices, but I don't know that guy. I know about these people. I don't know them. Here Jesus says, Peter, you know me. Finally, you know me. Somebody knows me. And you didn't figure that out on your own. God has told you. My father told you who I am. The first gift is Jesus. The second gift is to know him. Because all sorts of people have studied Jesus or heard about Jesus or read about Jesus, but still don't get who he is. Muslims know about Jesus, and atheists, lots of atheists have studied about Jesus, or Jehovah's Witnesses, or Mormons, all sorts of other people have learned about him, but haven't discovered him, haven't come to know him, and that knowledge is a gift, that he is the son of the living God, the savior of the world. Jesus continues in verse 18, he says this, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is one of the most divisive verses in the entire Bible. This one right here. This is what splits Catholics from the rest of the Protestant church. There have been volumes, books, thousands, tens of thousands of pages written about these few words. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit trail, but here's the division. Here's the separation. What is Jesus building his church on? That's the question. The Catholic Church says God is building his church on Peter. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. They believe that he's talking about Peter, that Peter will be the foundation of the church. And so that's where the Catholic Church gets the idea of the Pope that Peter was the first pope of the church, and then every successive pope has filled Peter's role of being uh, the foundation, the, uh, the rock, the voice of God here on earth. And it's true, Peter goes on to have a huge role in the early church as it starts up the first number of chapters of Acts. The Catholic Church says the rock is Peter. Other Protestant churches, including us Lutherans, would say it's not Peter that's the rock, it's the confession he just made. You are the Messiah, Son of the living God. We say it's not Peter. We see Peter flub it up and flounder and fail. We'll see him do that again later in the book of Acts. We say it's not Peter. It's that core belief that that's the rock. That's the foundation of the church. If you make me a promise, I'll be very honest and authentic with you. The promise is this. You have to promise not to phone head office in Winnipeg of Lutheran Church Canada and report me. Deal? Okay. I think it's both. I think that there's some of both in this passage. I think that the foundation is that confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's true. That is the foundation. That's the defining point. Either you believe in Jesus and that's what you believe or you believe something else and and you're wrong. It's short. It falls short. Either Jesus is that or he's not. Either you're in or you're out. That's the dividing line. But I also believe that God is or Jesus is saying that Peter will be a rock that will be used to build up the church. Who is the rock in the Bible? Anyone know? 
Well, God in general, throughout the Old Testament, God re- repeatedly refers to himself as the rock. Not Dwayne Johnson, but the original rock. In verses like this, it's all through the Old Testament, but here's a few of them. The first one from Deuteronomy. It says this, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. From 2 Samuel, For who is God besides the Lord, and who is a rock besides our God? From Isaiah, Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. God is the rock. He's the foundation. So what is Peter? Peter is a stone that gets added to this spiritual house. That's what we're told later in the epistles. That Peter's a stone. And Matthew's a stone. And James and John, all the disciples, they're all stones that are added on top of this foundation that are building this house. In fact, you and I are also called living stones. That Jesus is the rock, the foundation, and all of us get added to it. We get brought in and it keeps getting built up into a spiritual house, which is the church. Okay, here we go. On this rock, I will build my church. That was the goal, to get to this verse, this word. On this rock, I will build my church. When you talk to people about church, the first thing that comes to mind for them is a building. Oh, I saw that church. I know that church. Ah, it's on the corner of uh, 60th and 179th, right? Right by Tweedsmere. They think about a church. You guys live beside a church, right? Every time I go to your house, I'm driving past a church. Lots of you know churches. Oh, I know that church. I've seen that church. We think of the building. When God talks about church, that's not at all what he is saying. The word in Greek is ecclesia. If you think of the book Ecclesiastes, the same sound, ecclesia, and it means a called out people or a called out assembly. So in Ecclesiastes, he's talking to a called out group of people. Come and listen to my wisdom, he says. He calls this group of people. The church is a called out people, a called out assembly. That's the church. It's not a building. It's the people. If you came here and you took away our stained glass and our pulpit and our chairs and the organ and you took out uh, the building, take the whole thing out, you take me out of here, take Michaela, she's out of here, Cindy's gone, you would be left with the church. Because the church is not bricks or organs or pipes or anything else. It's the people. It's the called out assembly. Called out of what? A couple things. When I think of being called out, I think of uh, being in grade six and my principal, Mr. Schley, calling me out into the hallway because I was in trouble. It was a beautiful January day in Quinnell, lots of snow, and my friends and I had this huge, epic snowball fight, which is against the rules because we all know a lot of people who have died in snowball fights, don't we? No, okay, it's never happened. But anyway, there's a rule at our school. You can have a snowball fight. We have this great snowball fight. I go back to class, think we've got away with it. Then there's a knock at the door, and in comes Mr. Schley, Ian, Tyler, Corey, Brent, out in the hallway. We were called out, and then there was a consequence. My consequence was I had to write a paper about China. I have no idea why. Like, what the connection point was, I have no idea. But anyway, I wrote a paper about China as a consequence for having a snowball fight. I was called out. I'd been caught. We are a people who have been called out. We've been called out on our sin. God has seen it. He knows it. We haven't fooled him. We haven't tricked him. We haven't hidden it from him. He has called us out. I see you in your sin. And so he calls us out. But he also calls us out to do what? To forgive us. He calls us out to be a special people, to be forgiven. He calls us out of darkness to light. He calls us out of death to life. He calls us out from among the masses to represent him in this world. You are a called out people, and I will build my church, my people, Jesus is saying here. I've been called out, called out for trouble, also called out for good. You've been a called out people. It means that the church is about the people, not the books, the chairs, the organ, or anything else. It means it's about the people. That means that you don't go to church. 
You are the church. It means you don't serve at the church. It means you serve as the church. It means you don't leave the church at the end. It means you go as the church at the end of the service. Right? It's a very different idea. It's not about coming to a place. It's about being a people. Wherever you go, we gather as the church, and then we scatter as the church. So when you leave here, Hillside Christian Church goes all over the place. A, there's a big glob of you that go to Wendy's, but the rest of you scatter to other places, right? Uh, Cloverdale and Langley and White Rock and wherever else. Surrey, we, we gather as church and then we scatter as church. And so where is the church during the week? All over the place. I think that's such a beautiful idea. It's not this building that's just sitting here and it has renters, people coming and going, all those other things. No, it goes. The church goes wherever you go. Keep your finger in Matthew for a second. Let's spin really quickly. Take a hard right to Colossians in your Bible. Turn right. Past the other Gospels, past Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Colossians is the book we're looking for. It's a short one. Put up your hand if you get it. Great. Okay, we got a crew of us there. Colossians 1 is the chapter we're looking for. Verse 8 Colossians 1, verse 18, says this. It's talking about Jesus and how Jesus is above everyone and everything else. Colossians 1, 18 says this. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. I just want to look at that very first part He is the head of the body, the church. There's a few things I love here. I love that it talks about the church as this body, a living thing, a living, moving, breathing organism, right? It's not a brick or a pile of bricks. It's alive. It's a body. I love that it talks about that we are the body and Jesus is the head. Which controls which? Which is in charge? Is your foot in charge or is the head in charge? Is the body in charge or is the head in charge? The head is supposed to be in charge, right? And the head sends signals everywhere else. The head leads. The head tells us what we're supposed to be up to and about and what we're supposed to be doing. Imagine if you're talking with someone after church and you're talking about where you're going to go for coffee and as you're talking, they're saying, oh yeah, when I get to Wendy's, I'm going to get a coffee and then I think I'll get the uh, whatever burger they have there, I don't really know, and then, ah, then I'll be heading home. Would that seem random and strange to you? Yeah. Because you're just having a conversation, and so there's no reason for the body to be flailing all over the place, right? It should be following the head's lead. As the body, church, are we following Jesus' lead? Or if we look around at the church around us, does it look a little bit like the body is flailing all over the place, And the head is given some pretty specific instructions, but the body's doing all sorts of things. If you saw me waving around like that, you'd think, oh, there's there's something wrong with Ian. Uh, There's a a sickness, an illness, a disease, right? Sometimes there are diseases that make people lose control of their bodies. They they shimmer, they shake, they move kind of uncontrollably. The body's not telling us that there's something wrong. Church, are we listening to the head? Are we following its lead, its guiding, its path set out for us? Or are we just kind of random and flailing around? If we're flailing, then we need to go back to Jesus and repent and start following his lead again so we can be doing what he calls us to do. Here's a quick recap, just thinking back to Matthew 16. Faith is personal. It's just you. What do you believe about Jesus? Faith is a gift from God. You didn't figure it out. My Father in heaven told you, and that's how you know who I am. This is the next thing that I really like in this. It says, I will build my church. Whose job is it to build the church? Who's going to do the work? Jesus. Jesus will build his church. That's what he says in Matthew 16. I will build my church. Does that mean we can all go get pina coladas and hang out in a hammock? I would love that. 
I like hammocks and pina coladas. But that's not what Peter does. Jesus says to him, I will build my church, Jesus says. I will build my church. And then what does Peter do? He goes and he fasts and he prays and he preaches and he leads Bible studies and he directs the church and he gives guidance and wisdom and all these other things. He doesn't sit back and say, okay, Jesus, you do the building of the church. I'll do the hanging out and drinking coffee. That's not how it works. As the body, as a living stone, as part of the structure of the church, Peter knows that he also needs to go. He gets to go and be light and life and bring hope and comfort and peace and all those other things. And as he does that, Jesus goes with him and he's the one who will build his church. There's two great promises in there. The first one is that Jesus will build the church, that he'll do the work. The second great promise is that the church is going to be built up because Jesus said it and he's going to do it. You might look around and say, well, I don't I don't feel like the church is growing. I don't feel like the church is being built. One way it's being built is by being in our Bibles. One way it's being built is by being in worship together. One way it's being built is by doing home groups and studies. One way it's being built is as you serve as the church. But I also believe Jesus is saying, I'm going to build the church. I'm going to gather more people, more stones. We might look and say, well, Lutheran Church Canada is kind of declining. Or, you know, that church on the street, they closed down, and now it's a, a feeder, or now it's a pub, or now it's a whatever We can just trust that Jesus is going to build his church. And I love what he says next. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Even when it looks bad, even when it seems like there's decline, even when you live in a country like Canada where people are moving away from the church, Jesus just made us three promises here that he'll build the church, that he'll be the one to do it, and that nothing is ever going to prevail against it. How can Jesus make that promise? Because he's going to go from the manger to the cross where he will defeat sin and the devil and death and the grave. And in Revelation, we're told that he's the one who holds the keys of all those things. He's the one who holds the keys of life. Nothing is going to prevail against his kingdom. Why not? Because there's nothing more powerful than he is. The gates of hell won't beat the church. It's never going to happen. It might shrink or grow or move or change or look different than it did. But Jesus has made us a promise there. I want to wrap up with a couple uh, just quick thoughts. Here's one. How many different churches are there? You know, if you look around, there's 40,000 different denominations. That's the estimate. 40,000 different denominations. You know how many different churches there are? Just one. Jesus doesn't say, I will build up my churches. He doesn't say, I am the head and you are my bodies. He says, I'm the head, you are my body. He talks about a bride and a groom. The church will be my bride. Just one. There's just one church. It's called the universal church. It's scattered all over, all over the place. And it might look and act and behave differently, but when you get to heaven, it won't be Jesus talking to all these different groups. Hey, where are the Pentecostals? I see you. You got your hands up over there. And oh, where are the Lutherans? In the back. Oh, those silly Lutherans always in the back. It won't be like that. There's just one church. Where's the church? All over the place. It's the universal church. Who's in the church? All those people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, son of the living God. What about people who don't believe that? Then they're not in the church. That's the dividing line Jesus has told us right here. There's just one church, the universal church. What we look at, what we think of are local churches. The Bible describes that too, but they're part of the one. We're local so that we can be specific in areas of ministry. Hillside Christian Church, our area of ministry is right here. It's local. Cloverdale. Tweedsmere, Surrey Christian, Zion Park Manor, uh, the Mosaic townhouses that are being built, Hawthorne townhouses, Dogwood Gardens, this area around us, this is our specific local geographic location. Can we veer off and go other places? Can we go to Mexico? Can we build a well in in, uh, Tanzania? Absolutely. But Jesus has called us here to be his uh, presence right here locally. We're called out people, called out on our sin, and then called out of that sin to grace, and to holiness, and and to beauty from ashes, and to life, and hope, and truth, and comfort, all through Jesus who came for us, who lived and died and rose again for us. Who are you? You are the church. 
Who are we? We are the church, a called out people, called to bring glory and praise and honor to Him, called to live lives that are set apart and different from the world around us, called to carry His light and hope and truth and comfort and peace wherever we go, called to gather as a church and then scattered as the church. Church, the good news of this morning is this. You are a people belonging to God. He's called you each by name, and you belong to him. And now wherever you go, he goes, and he will build his church. And nothing ever will prevail against that. There's nothing that can ever separate you from his love. There's nothing that can ever overcome his church and his bride and his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and a chance to look at Matthew 16 together. I, we just looked at a portion of it, God, but you tell us so much here about your church. And so I pray that as we go this week, that we would remember that. That we would remember that the church is in this building. And even though we need to take care of the building, that it, that's not the central goal. It isn't to have a beautiful facility. It's not to have the newest carpet or the best stained glass that we ourselves are your church, your body. And so wherever we go, we go as the church, that the church lives and moves and breathes in us and through us. And so I pray that wherever we go, we'd bring light and hope and truth. And God, we thank you that we're not the ones who are meant to build the church, that we're meant to faithfully serve you and walk with you and listen to you just like a, a body listens to the head. And so, God, I pray that we would be faithful in that and that we'd be faithful in things like fasting and prayer and fellowship and encouragement and evangelism and all those things and that we would trust that you'd be the one through all those things who would build the church. And, God, we thank you that, that we're not alone, that this isn't all about Hillside Christian Church, but it's about your universal church around the globe, from uh, Cloverdale to Kansas to Kathmandu and everywhere in between, that you are the one, the head of the whole entire church, and that you've given us the privilege of serving you right here. And we do that by serving the people around us. So I pray that we would be bold in that knowing that no matter what happens to us, nothing will ever prevail against your church and nothing will be able to separate us from you because of your great love for us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, the one who came to live and die and rise again for us. We thank you for the gift of faith that we don't just know about you, but that we know you. And God, I pray that in this year, in 2019, that we would come to know you more, not just more information, but that we'd come to know you personally more, that we would understand you, that we would uh, come to experience your presence and closeness and hear your voice and sense your leading more and more and more, God. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for all the school families who will be returning this week, the teachers and parents and everyone involved in Surrey Christian School. We pray for those up at the manor. We pray for the people at Tweedsmere. God, we haven't had a voice there for a long time, but we pray that we would begin to do that as we take seriously our calling here to serve you for everything else in our hearts and minds. We commit all those things to you, trusting in your son Jesus who taught us to pray.